All right. Uh, well, again, we're here, so let's uh, dive into another type of waveguide. This time a coaxial waveguide, and uh, see what we need to do. The statement is, show directly that the electric and magnetic fields for a coaxial transmission line satisfy Maxwell's equations and the boundary conditions. Find the charge density, lambda Z of T, and the current, I Z of T, on the inner conductor. All right. So for a coaxial transmission line, we have E in cylindrical coordinates. Um, I don't know why I have... Uh, no comma there after z, but four dimensions, uh, s, phi, z, and t. Uh, and then we have a, some constant over s, cosine kz minus omega t in the s hat direction. b, s, phi, z, t is equal to a, uh, c over s, cosine, same thing, just in the phi hat direction. All right, and the boundary conditions that we have are... E parallel equals zero and B perpendicular equals zero. All right, pretty straightforward on par with everything else we've seen. So Maxwell's equations for a for guided waves, well, uh, what we need to do is take the divergence of E and see if it's equal to zero. So uh, the cylindrical divergence is one over S partial S of S E S component. So if we... Uh, plug the ES component in, we see that the S is canceled. Again, uh, the spherical divergence in curls or cylindrical, you don't need every component, so I don't always include every component because the other ones will just go to zero. So I'm only going to uh, put in the appropriate components that will actually have something to show. Uh, but nonetheless, we simplify down by canceling the S's, and then we take the partial of what's in the brackets, which has nothing to do with S, so that goes to zero. And indeed, the divergence of E equals zero. Good to go. What about the divergence of B? Okay, well, that's uh, 1 over S uh, D by D phi of B of phi. Okay, so let's plug everything in. And uh, you see, once we plug it in, uh, we have uh, everything in the bracket has nothing to do with phi, so that's a constant and goes to zero. Wonderful. Now, does the curl of E equal the negative time derivative of B? Okay, well... Does the curl, if we write out the curl in cylindrical for ES component only, um, is that equal to negative B uh, DT of, in the phi hat direction? Well, when we set up the curl, we notice we have a phi hat and a Z hat, but D by D phi of E of S, well, E of S has nothing to do with phi, so that whole thing goes to zero. So, so far, we're looking pretty good. Now, I just actually have to see if everything works out. So the derivative with respect to Z of ES gives us AS uh, times negative sine KZ minus omega T. And now we have to, the cosine goes to negative sine, hence the negative in front. And we have the chain rule, so we get a K there. Now the time derivative of B, well that gives us a factor of omega, uh, a, uh, negative omega due to chain rule, but also the cosine goes to negative sine. So we have negatives that cancel. Um, so on both sides, we have a negative. That's good. And K, the wave number, we can write as omega over C. So on both sides, we have an A omega over CS. Good to go there. And both sides, both Vs, we're good to go. Uh, that one checks off pretty easy. Now, does the curl of B equal 1 over C squared uh, D by DT of E? Well, same thing. We'll write out the curl components and see if it is equal to the uh, time derivative component of the E, which is in the S hat. So uh, once we plug everything in, we see that uh, D by B phi over DZ, uh, we can actually evaluate that derivative. The other one, uh, once we substitute it in, we see that the S is cancel, and there's nothing to take the derivative of with respect to S, so the Z component of the curl goes to zero. And now we just need to see if it's equal to the time derivative of the E field after we substitute that in. So take the derivatives. Uh, you see we get a factor of K from the Z derivative. The negatives cancel on that when we convert from sine or cosine to sine. And similarly, for the time derivative, we get a negative sine from cosine to sine. And we also get a negative sine from the negative omega due to chain rule. So the negatives cancel. Once again, substitute in omega C for the K. 
highlighted in red. And we see that we get a A omega over C squared S on both. Both sine functions, both S hats. So we're good to go. Satisfies the equations. Now, the boundary conditions must also be satisfied. So parallel, E parallel to this thing has to be zero. Or, excuse me, the E field parallel to the propagation, which is the Z direction, has to be zero. Okay, good to go. Perpendicular to this S has to be zero, which it is. Okay, so everything as far as the boundary conditions are working. Wonderful. All right, next, B. To determine the charge density, use Gauss's law for a cylinder of radius S and length DZ. Okay, so Gauss's law being closed integral of uh, DA, is Q enclosed or epsilon naught? Push that through, we get E naught over S cosine uh, KZ minus omega T, and then we have a cylinder of radius S and length DZ. Good to go there. We see that the S is cancel, but the Q enclosed is equal to lambda of the density times some length DZ, and so the DZ factors cancel. So we get a lot of cancellations there, and if we solve for lambda, we get lambda z of t is equal to e naught 2 pi epsilon naught cosine kz minus omega t. Good to go. And to determine the current, use Ampere's law for a circle of radius s. So the closed line integral is equal to mu i enclosed. Do the same thing. We have a uh, circle of radius s, so the uh, 2 pi s comes from the dl. And we see that the s is cancel. And we're left with mu naught i enclosed, so i, once we solve for it, is equal to 2 pi e naught over mu naught c cosine kz minus omega t. And we're good to go. Easy enough.